thanks, Johanan. Um, when I when I started putting together this this uh, presentation, I regretted uh, giving this title to the organizers um, because I realized that well, I, I wouldn't be able to talk about what I wanted to talk, which is showing our, our results. But well, I, I think it's 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 likely to still be interesting, at least from my point of view, uh, to try to make sense out of a very uh, strange and difficult uh, uh, soup of uh, acronyms that you might have seen this week, and very few if you have been attending this kind of meetings uh, before, uh, they, they, there are many more acronyms. And uh, I'll, I'll try to make a, well, to shed a bit, a bit of light on, on this. Not, not easy and not obvious. Uh, just to introduce myself, uh, the, uh, just briefly, I come from the uh, Barcelona Supercomputing Center in Barcelona. And uh, I, I lead a department with around 50 people who work on environmental forecasting. And uh, these are the kind of things that we do, uh, well, atmospheric composition, so atmospheric chemistry, um, cloud prediction, uh, computational uh, earth sciences, and, uh, and uh, also services. And uh, the, the two aspects, uh, or the, the two groups that uh, have been uh, pulling some results for this presentation from are the, uh, the one on services and uh, the climate prediction one, uh, of course. Um, so this is, this is the, uh, one of the sentences that I took from the uh, page that uh, describes the, uh, the workshop. And uh, it, it mentions WCRP, uh, and which is the World Climate Research Program for those who don't know it. Um, and uh, its core projects, and uh, WCRP has four, pro uh, four projects. Uh, click here that works on the cryosphere, Clivar, uh, GeoX that works on the uh, uh, hydrological cycle, and Spark that is interested in the, uh, in the uh, stratosphere. Uh, and uh, obviously, we are in, uh, in Clivar. This is a Cliver workshop. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the sentence also says that, uh, uh, well, WCRP has identified an interest in decadal climate variability and predictability. And that, that uh, brings along a, a, another acronym, DCVP. And I, I warn you that the acronyms are going to crop up uh, quite a lot in this presentation. So I'll, I'll try to uh, uh, spell them out uh, as, as often as I can. So DCVP, which appears here as, well, a, an acronym for a concept, is also a group of people who are uh, meeting uh, this afternoon and tomorrow to discuss about, uh, well, this kind of aspects. And it's uh, one of the research foci of uh, Cliver. I'll, I'll show it uh, a bit later. And also to continue the experimental climate prediction, which is something that is managed by another group that is called DCPP. So there is a P instead of the V. Um, so also in, uh, in WCRP, you have working groups. Uh, there are four, and one of them is WGCM, the uh, working group on coupled uh, modeling. And uh, this is, this is uh, the, the working group that is managing CIMIP. So CIMIP is part of WCRP. So CIMIP is not IPCC, CIMIP is WCRP. Mike uh, will tell me off if I don't clarify this thing. Um, so there is another working group that is relevant here, which is WGSIP. Uh, this is mainly uh, the, the working group I'm involved with, uh, and it's the working group on seasonal to interannual <laughs> prediction. And uh, for instance, uh, WGSIP is, is uh, hosting DCPP, the uh, Decadal Climate Prediction Project, which is one of the uh, modeling or comparison projects of CIMIP-6. And uh, it's, again, it has a panel with uh, lots of very interesting people. But WGCIP is also doing lots of other things. Uh, so, for instance, one of the uh, projects that is relevant to what has been discussed here is a project on drift and initial shock. Uh, and uh, you've heard already a few presentations about uh, drift and initial shock from, uh, from Christoph just a, a few moments ago and also yesterday. So these are two of the uh, four groups, uh, working groups of, uh, of WCRP. WCRP also has uh, 
grand challenges. And uh, there are six here, one uh, that uh, I put here in white because it's the most relevant to us, that is the grand challenge on near-term climate prediction. If you want to know what the grand challenge is going to do, talk to Johannan. Uh, he has all the information. There, there, there is not much information yet, to be honest. But uh, uh, So this, this gives you a, a, well, a fairly uh, quick uh, overview of what WCRP is doing. But uh, there are other things, other organizations inside the core projects, for instance, that are also relevant. Inside Clivark, for instance, we have a panel, which is the uh, uh, group on uh, synthesis and observations, uh, which is mainly looking into uh, the uh, different ocean reanalysis and, and, uh, and uh, reference products that we can use to validate and initialize our systems uh, for uh, forecasting. But there are also research foci, and one of the research focuses of of, of Cliver is DCVP, this decadal climate, uh, uh, decadal climate variability and predictability uh, group. So this is complex enough, uh, but things are even more complex. And uh, outside WCRP, we have WWRP, which is a World Weather Research Program. So the weather people, they get organized separately, and uh, there are they, they are as numerous as we are. And uh, there are some uh, initiatives in, in, inside WRP. Some of them are coordinated with uh, WCRP. One of them is the sub-seasonal to seasonal project. Again, concerned by some of the problems that uh, we've been talking about here, initialization, for instance. PVP, which is a polar prediction project that has to do with, uh, for instance, some of the, uh, the, the things that Amy has uh, described in her presentation. Uh, and the uh, joint working group on focused uh, verification research. That, that uh, the people with this horrible acronym that you see there, they do really interesting things. So I'll try to illustrate some of them. Um, and then on this side, uh, on, the, uh, on the right, you have other uh, initiatives and, uh, and panels and, uh, and uh, that are very, well, you, you might be familiar with. Uh, which is the IPCC that uh, uh, takes a lot of information from CIMIP, but also from the rest of uh, WCRP, at least for, for, for working groups uh, one and two. Uh, and also GFCS, which is a global framework for climate services, which is, again, something, another initiative inside WMO. And WMO is outside all this and is much, much bigger. So there are many more panels and committees and... Uh, um, and uh, as I, I, I'm sure that you, you will agree that uh, it's, it's quite difficult to make sense out of this. Uh, and and I, I guess that people are already quite happy of being here. Uh, and, uh, and uh, well, that's, that's already organizing your work and uh, your contacts enough. But um, let, me, let me be a bit, a, a bit controversial here. Um, uh, in my opinion, this is very compartmental. It, it's, it's, uh, it's preventing uh, progress, and uh, I think uh, we need to be a bit more promiscuous and, uh, and, and try to be engaged uh, as much as we can uh, in uh, activities that other communities are doing. Because somehow this is a Cliver meeting where, for instance, the uh, uh, Spark people are not present, or where, I don't know, people working on the... Uh, uh, grand challenge on cloud circulation and climate sensitivity are not here. Uh, but climate sensitivity, sensitivity is fundamental for the kind of thing that we are doing. Uh, why this happens? Well, I, I guess that we all have ideas about uh, why, why this is the case. So uh, let me go a bit uh, more into some of these uh, initiatives and panels. Um, CIMIP 5 uh, was designed to feed uh, the uh, fifth assessment report of the IPCC, and uh, at least for the decadal uh, prediction part uh, that contributed to, the, to chapter 11 of uh, the working group one report, uh, there were a few lessons. This is my selection. I'm sure that many of you will uh, remove some of them and uh, add many, many more that I'm sure that will be very important and uh, very, very interesting. But just to start with, um, there is, there is a, a well, a climate prediction and a climate modeling community that got together to do, to start uh, the Cato prediction. And uh, the, the first thing that 
uh, we realized after two years of fights is that we were talking about different things uh, with the same words. So there was a massive language problem. And I, I, I was talking about this with uh, Susanna yesterday. It's a horrible, terrible situation. Um, and uh, something else that uh, it was obvious is that decadal prediction has skill. There's skill, there's skill over the continents, at least for temperature. For precipitation, it's not the case, except in uh, certain regions. But there is skill. Decadal prediction has skill. Sorry if I repeat it, but uh, many people say that decadal prediction doesn't have skill. It's not true. There is skill. Uh, but most of the skill in temperature, at least in temperature, is forced by uh, forcings, uh, natural and external forcings. Um, and uh, we saw um, uh, in Gavin's uh, presentation, you, you talked on Monday, Gavin, I think it was, uh, that if we had the right forcings, we could have predicted the, uh, uh, well, much better the, uh, the uh, slowdown of global mean temperature. Unfortunately, we don't have the forcings because we are doing prediction. Uh, so we have to live with that. Uh, we also need to have uh, many more handcasts than the ones that uh, were done for CIMIP-5, uh, starting every five years. Bovu yesterday showed uh, how the, the, the skill scores uh, go up and down, and uh, we've seen other examples as well. Um, and uh, also, it's, it's very important to use the same model configuration as uh, the, the, the ones that are used for climate experiments. Uh, Christophe has been talking about the... Uh, um, uh, the pacemaker and the, uh, and the uh, uh, fixed anomaly experiments, and uh, uh, he could use the, the same model that he was using for the historical experiments. So is it the same version that you used for the decadal predictions? And uh, this is uh, the, 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 the way we can, we can really learn about our, about our decadal prediction systems, uh, because uh, if we start changing uh, the, 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 the versions, it's, it's going to be very difficult to, to, make, to make progress. So learn about your model and, uh, and its, and its uh, drawbacks. And uh, uh, the other really tough thing was uh, that drift, initial shock, and systematic error are hampering uh, the progress of, of decadal prediction. Uh, and it, several of us uh, have been talking here about why we didn't do more uh, flux correction for decadal prediction. Uh, well, I don't know. Um, Maybe it's, some, it's, a, it's a time to, to, to do some work. Julia has been doing some, and at ECM Dolev as well, but uh, it's not systematic. Um, so this is one of the plots that was showed uh, uh, before. Uh, this is the, the, uh, these are the decadal predictions in solid for, from uh, CIMIT-5 uh, uh, from systems started, uh, that started every year. In gray, you have the observations. In dashed, you have the... Uh, the, uh, uh, the historical runs for, on the left, uh, global mean temperature, on the right, AMV. The, uh, it's a simple AMV index, uh, which, which takes an aerial average of uh, SSD over the North Atlantic minus the uh, global mean temperature. And uh, it's, it's quite uh, nice to see that the uh, uh, AMV is better predicted uh, when you initialize than uh, when, uh, when you use the historical runs. Uh, and uh, it's also striking the similarity between the, uh, uh, the global mean temperature predicted and also from the historical runs. Uh, but we have this. Um, I think it was Susanna who mentioned that the, histori the, uh, the uh, uh, historical runs were over overdoing the uh, uh, global mean temperature in the last 10 years, uh, while the, uh, the uh, uh, initialized simulations didn't. Um, and uh, there, are, there might be two ways to explain what happened here. One is that uh, the CIMIP-5 systems were very good at uh, phasing in the internal variability. The other one is that they are correcting the uh, incorrect forced model response in our systems. And I, I, I would like to advocate for the second one. So it's true that CIMIP-5 uh, didn't use the correct volcanic aerosol forcing, and the aerosols were not correct. But somehow, by initializing, we are correcting by, for, for these, these uh, errors in the forcing. Um, so basically, there are two things that we, we should expect from uh, the cadre prediction. One is the phase-in of the uh, internal variability, which is something that we've been talking about here, which is something really tough. Uh, but the other one is the correction of the forced model response up to a certain uh, time into the future. And uh, let me 
go a bit more in detail uh, uh, for, uh, with, uh, in, 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 with this idea. Uh, but uh, this is another sentence from the page uh, describing the workshop uh, that says that, well, the, the, uh, the warming hiatus caught us uh, by surprise. But the, there was a failure uh, of the initialized coupled uh, model predictions to detect it. Uh, in my opinion, this is not true. Uh, they, they detected it, they predicted it in, uh, well, in hindsight. Um, but was it for the right reasons or not? It depends on what the right reasons are for us, but for the users, the right reasons is whether they can really make better decisions on, uh, based on the information that we give them. Um, so more on the uh, uh, correction of the forced model response. This is, uh, these are results from a very nice experiment that was run years ago at the, at the Met Office. A huge uh, data set was constructed using uh, the perturb parameters, the perturb parameter approach for the perturbation of the, uh, of the model. Uh, the uh, several configuration of, uh, of the model uh, were, were run uh, in the cable focus mode uh, with uh, uh, initialization and without initialization. Uh, and uh, one of the interesting things about uh, this, this uh, system is that uh, you could, uh, you have several configurations of the same model with uh, different, um, different uh, 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 responses to, to, the, uh, uh, to, to the forcings. So these are, uh, well, measures of scale in terms of correlation for temperature, uh, and uh, the vertical axis uh, represents the aggregation of the uh, uh, forecasts uh, in spatially, while the horizontal axis represents the uh, focus time. So we are aggregating in focus time or we are aggregating in spatially. So we are smoothing the maps, basically, as we go up in this axis here. So the uh, first, uh, uh, the first uh, 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 column corresponds to the uh, uninitialized runs, the second one to the initialized runs, and uh, this is the difference in correlation. And uh, the difference between these three configurations, I forget the but the, but the numbers, well, the configuration one, two, and three, uh, is that this one, the one at the top, has the, uh, uh, the highest slope in uh, global mean temperature in the uh, uh, historical run. Uh, the second uh, and the third are the ones with the, uh, the uh, 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 smallest slopes in the, uh, in the global mean temperature. So what we can see is that uh, the impact of the uh, initialization is much bigger when we have shallower slopes in the global mean temperature than in the, uh, than, uh, uh, well, stronger slopes. The, uh, the interpretation of this is that, uh, again, the uh, initialization is doing more than just phasing in the, uh, the uh, internal variability. And the, the, the reason why we are benefiting is because the models have the wrong forced uh, uh, response to the, to the forcings. Um, starting every year, the handcuffs, it makes the handcuffs much more expensive. Uh, it's not the same uh, doing handcuffs every five years than uh, running handcuffs every, every year. Um, but it has an impact on what we can say about, about uh, our systems. Uh, this is the skill for the AMV. Uh, it's a function of the focus time, and uh, each color corresponds to a different uh, 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 time averaging of the forecasts. So in red is uh, the uh, root mean square error for the uh, forecasts uh, taken every year, uh, and uh, well, in, uh, in uh, green are, uh, is uh, the result for the forecasts when we have averaged them every th uh, in three years into the forecast and so on. So we are, we have more and more uh, smooth version of the time series. So when we initialized every five years, which is what we see here, we see ups and downs, and uh, we saw some of the uh, results yesterday. Uh, that, uh, well, they seem to suggest that there was a recovery of skill uh, after a few years into the focus, which sometimes is a bit difficult to explain. However, if, if you take exactly the same period, so 1960 to 2005 for the verification, and look at the, uh, uh, what is the, uh, the uh, root mean square error when you initialize every year, uh, basically, we have exactly the same information here. We are not in, in increasing the number of uh, degrees of freedom of the, uh, of the uh, skill, uh, but we are having much smoother versions of, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, skill measures. And uh, the reason is that uh, 
we need to sample the internal variability during the period where, when we are, we are uh, making the forecasts. Uh, I'm not saying that it's absolutely necessary to, to do uh, high costs every year, but every five years is definitely too little. And uh, well, this is uh, something similar when looking at uh, individual models. So um, I'm talking all the time about prediction. And uh, in prediction, we are initializing a climate model. Uh, and we do this, as I said before, to, uh, to address internal variability, to, go to, to take into account the, uh, the incorrect force model response. And uh, we uh, initialize the model uh, by uh, uh, using the, the, the best available observations. So we have to link to the observationalists, whoever they are. That's already a first challenge to identify them. Um, to transfer that information into the, uh, into the couple model, uh, avoiding imbalances, uh, again, but uh, uh, it's easier said than, than done, as uh, the, you, you heard the discussion yesterday. Um, and then we need to run with uh, initial perturbations that, uh, well, pr produce a, a, a spread that is uh, representative of the uh, uh, uncertain, uncertainties that we have, which are a lot, but that, uh, unfortunately, the uncertainties are uncertain. So, what we do is something like this. We, uh, we, uh, uh, we run a set of high costs uh, with uh, an ensemble. In this case, well, let's say five members for the, uh, for the sake of illustration. Uh, one year later, we do the same thing. Or, and then uh, uh, five years later, we've done already six uh, high costs. And we carry on doing this thing every year. And uh, we start from a, an observational data set, some measure of what the, uh, the current state of the climate system is. Not necessarily the best estimates of the, uh, of the uh, uh, state of the climate system, okay, for prediction. Uh, the reality is slightly different because Susanna, I think, showed uh, this, or uh, Daniela showed this, this, this plot from the IPCC, where we can see that uh, in the IPCC we had models that used the anomaly initialization approach, the full field initialization approach, but even if they, uh, they used the anomaly initialization approach, the systematic errors were massive. And uh, those using the, uh, the uh, full field initialization approach, they are suffering from uh, these drifts that you see here. You don't see the initial shocks, but they are astonishing. They are, and and it's, it's really enlightening to have a look at a decadal forecast and, and have, see an animation of any variable uh, using six hourly or three hourly values. You, with, with a month is enough. You don't need to go any farther. The, the model is all over the place. It's incredible. It destroys everything that you are, you're putting in. It's, it's so amazing. And it's, it's very nice to see because you see all the processes that we've been talking about here in action all at the same time uh, without interaction, with interaction. And uh, the problem is that we are forecasting while the model is doing this. So we are trying to say something about the future while the model is in complete... Uh, well, going through a complete uh, reorganization of the information in, in, in itself. So um, we need to do something. And uh, some of the things that were done was a discussion about uh, an evaluation of the uh, uh, relative merits of uh, 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 the, the, the anomaly initialization approach. And there are many uh, uh, approximations that have been implemented for the uh, anomaly initialization approach. Um, so several institutions carried out uh, Again, as, as a result of CIMIP-5, but also in, uh, as part of CIMIP-5, uh, they carried out a, a intercomparison experiments where they uh, either initialized in the uh, uh, real world, uh, which is uh, here in green, and uh, if you do this, then the model uh, just goes to its own attractor, so it drifts. Uh, or you initialize here, and uh, you initialize in the, uh, in the model world, which is already biased, but at least you know that uh, the initial shock is going to be smaller or inexistent. So um, there are many examples of this. I'm, I'm just giving one example here, but the Met Office looked into it, uh, and uh, MPI and the University of Hamburg have, have looked into it. And uh, many other people, uh, for instance, Environment Canada has, has, do, has done the same thing. But, Unfortunately, until now, there are very few uh, uh, proofs or very few hints that anomaly cell initialization is giving us a better skill. Uh, in fact, uh, it seems that full field initialization is giving bit better skill in spite of the initial shocks and the drift. And uh, this is an example from 
uh, Daniela Volpi, uh, who uh, looked at different ways of implementing uh, anomaly initialization in the ocean, uh, taking into account uh, just the, uh, uh, the anomaly, uh, correcting the anomalies uh, in uh, T and S, or in T and, uh, and uh, density, or uh, uh, introducing some anomaly initialization as well in the CIs. And there are small differences and, and small improvements coming from the anomaly initialization, for instance, in the AMV or in the Arctic CIs volume. But after three years, no distinction, no difference whatsoever in terms of scale. Um, and you have to really fight hard to, to get the anomaly initialization working because you have all sorts of drifts and, uh, and uh, misplacements of the uh, observed anomalies in, uh, in, uh, into the model. Basically, it's a, it's a data simulation problem in, not in the observed attractor, but in the model attractor. Far from done. Um, so it's a, it's a really nice challenge, but we have to do something in the meantime to provide uh, the users with some information. We also did some additional work. I won't go, I won't go into the details. Uh, uh, it, to try to understand a bit more why in, uh, under certain conditions we were having uh, better skill uh, in the first one or two years with uh, the full field initialization and why in other conditions we were having it with anomaly initialization. And uh, we used a, a, a hierarchy of models, uh, basically the Lorenz model, the Penyan Kalne model, which is a version of the Lorenz model with nine variables, and uh, also the uh, Van Itzum and the Cruz uh, model, which is a, a, a simplified uh, couple model with uh, uh, less than, well, it's 29 variables. And uh, what we found out uh, using a very simple mapping uh, approach uh, to implement the uh, anomaly initialization is that uh, when the uh, attractors are uh, incompatible, when the, the, uh, the uh, model attractor and the uh, observed attractor are, are not compatible, then there is a massive initial shock. The initial information uh, uh, is, uh, uh, is, is lost after just a few uh, time steps. And then the model uh, is, is better in, uh, in uh, using a, an, an anomaly initialization approach. But so most of the times, the, uh, the attractors are not fully incompatible. They are compatible, but uh, they have differences, for instance, in certain variables in the kurtosis or in the, uh, in the, uh, uh, in the uh, skewness. And uh, that's uh, making the uh, linear approach for the implementation of uh, the anomaly installation, which is one, the, the one that has been implemented uh, until now, uh, uh, really uh, uh, unfeasible and uh, giving uh, the, the well, uns unsatisfactory results. Uh, these are two of the references of this work using uh, simplif simplified models. But it's, uh, it's an example of how uh, we need a, 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 a hierarchy of model that goes even beyond you know, just looking at AMIP runs or, or uh, ocean-only runs. Uh, we, we really need to, to uh, put an, uh, under, under the test the, uh, the, the approaches and the concepts that we are, we are using. Um, so there is, uh, there is going to be a bit more discussion about this uh, next year. Uh, we are organizing a, a workshop in Barcelona. Uh, uh, it's uh, sponsored by the SPECS and the Preface uh, European projects, and uh, it's, uh, uh, it will also receive sponsoring from uh, WHSIP, which is the working group on seasonal to interannual prediction. And uh, basically the, the idea is to come up uh, to, to, to an agreement in, in terms of the kind of experiments that we need to address this, this, this issue. Uh, the, in, the issue of the initial shock and the, and the drift, but at the same time, uh, discuss about the feasibility of coupled initialization and uh, note that I'm not talking here about coupled data simulation. I'm talking about coupled initialization, which is a different thing, um, to address the, the problem. And for this, we need representatives of the uh, global uh, of the uh, uh, group on uh, synthesis and observations panel from of, of Glyvar. So again, trying to be a bit more promiscuous here. Um, and the other objective this, of this workshop is to discuss about an eventual recommendation from WCRP uh, on the problem of bias adjustment. So in the end, the users they need something that is not an anomaly. They need a field that they can use, and a field that resembles the reality. And uh, this, is, this, this is something that uh, it still requires a lot of work. CIMIP 6, uh, this is coming up. Uh, uh, Christophe has already uh, mentioned some of the, uh, the, 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 the activities of uh, at least 
decadal component of CMIP6, DCPP. Uh, in that context, decadal prediction can benefit uh, from a better understanding, uh, from uh, the, uh, the possibility of looking into the control runs and understanding the, uh, the, uh, the characteristics of the variability in our models, and also from the infrastructure. Uh, if we want to share data, uh, it's all done. So it's, it's already there. So we, we'd rather be uh, uh, close to what w WGCM is already doing. Uh, other MIPS, other model intercomparison inter projects can also benefit from uh, the decadal prediction uh, part of CMIP6 uh, because there will be more people looking at the reduction of the systematic error. We, we have uh, a massive interest in reducing this because it's destroying our con initial condition information. Not all, but a lot of it. And also because uh, we'll, we'll do a continuous verification of the models. We are continuously comparing with observations, with real observations. Um, but it's very expensive. These are really huge uh, uh, experiments. Uh, at the same time, there will be a real-time decadal prediction component in uh, CMIP6 uh, that is uh, led by uh, DCPP, is uh, the one uh, called component B. Uh, and uh, there will be also, uh, hopefully, a lot of work on looking at other processes that might bring additional skill. Uh, so for, before CMIP6, we have to work on issues like, for instance, the impact of the volcanic aerosol and how we project the volcanic aerosol into the future. It's uh, one of the uh, tasks in, uh, of, of component C uh, because in the end, uh, we have to recognize that we can't predict volcanoes and even if a volcano went off, we want to have the real estimates of the forcings or the aerosol loads uh, before a few years after the, the volcano has, has gone off. Um, we also need to set benchmarks. Um, it's it's uh, very good to, to keep working with uh, couple models. They are very complex. We've seen lots of their limitations. But at the same time, there are people working on very interesting alternatives that uh, can, can really help the development of the model, but at the same time be used as a benchmark. And uh, a good example is, uh, you could see it in, uh, in uh, uh, um, I'm a cycling uh, poster uh, this week. This is an example of the, uh, uh, the, skill, uh, the skill score in terms of correlation uh, for the uh, decadal prediction, the empirical decadal prediction system that they've, they, they've, they've built. This, this system has the uh, additional uh, interest that there is, uh, it's a system that is calibrated, so it's, it's probabilistic. It's not just giving you a value for, for the next five or 10 years. It's, it's giving you a range of values that are calibrated with the observations. Um, and then we have observational uncertainty. The observational uncertainty is hurting us in, uh, in creating the initial conditions. And uh, it was very nice to hear the, uh, the argument yesterday between uh, Doug and, uh, and Alicia. Not that I like to hear you arguing, but uh, I like the, what you say when you argue. Um, but they also, they also limit our ability to know what the skill of our systems is. And uh, this is an illustration from seasonal forecasting. It's uh, from a set of seasonal forecasts we run with uh, Easy Earth, uh, the new version of Easy Earth. Uh, and uh, uh, this, are, uh, uh, this is the skill for Neo 3.4, for uh, Hankas started in, uh, on the 1st of May and running for four months. And uh, it's a uh, skill for each month uh, for the same system, but uh, evaluated against uh, uh, far, four different uh, uh, observational data sets. The, uh, the one from ESA, it's a 25 kilometer data set that uh, has been recent, recently released. All the others are uh, low resolution data sets. And uh, we found out that when validating forecasts from uh, high resolution systems, uh, well, you have to take into account also the uncertainty that is associated to the resolution of the observations, which is, which is again, something quite fascinating to look at. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, GFCS, again, another component. This one is outside the WCRP, so uh, you, you don't need to feel concerned uh, about it, but it's a, it's a very nice thing. Um, it stands for uh, Global Framework for Climate Services, and uh, Basically, we are here in the research modeling and prediction part. But uh, just to give you an, an idea of what climate services is about, we are just in a corner. And uh, the observationalists are a bit here, uh, uh, next to us. But the, uh, 
the bulk of the climate services is a completely different kind of problem. Uh, where we have something to say and uh, where uh, the, uh, some communities are waiting for us to interact with them. Um, these communities, they get together and uh, the, the, one of them uh, is getting together in the uh, Euporius project, which is another European project, uh, this, this one led by the MetaFest. And they came up with uh, these uh, success, success, uh, the principles for a successful climate service. So, it's, it's actually quite nice, uh, it, it looks funny, but it's, it has a lot of uh, depth into it. So it, it's a matter of defining your problem, having a roadmap, being flexible, uh, verify and evaluate and monitor, being transparent to avoid, uh, to avoid tensions, uh, being able to listen and use the principles of uh, research uh, and, and development. Um, these principles, uh, that you might think that they are very obvious and that they are, they've been put there for the users, uh, actually they are not for the users. They put them together for us. So this is what they expect from us uh, to have a successful uh, climate service. Uh, and on top of this, uh, it's actually interesting to see what, what they are coming up with. They, they write really interesting reports. Um, there is a very nice one that was recently released. It's the Ethical Framework for Climate Services. I, I know it sounds a bit uh, pompous, but it's, it's, it's really interesting reading, very short. And it's based on four core elements that they, they, want, to, uh, they, they, they want to propose that everyone interested in climate services abide for, uh, 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 well follows. Integrity, transparency, humility, and collaboration. And, uh, uh, as obvious as they are, and as, uh, as much as we think that we follow them, uh, I think I, I, did, I did my own exercise uh, of, uh, uh, well, critical exercise to, to try to assess if uh, I was uh, following them, and uh, I failed in two of them. So um, I, I'd suggest, or I would like to encourage you to, to try something similar. In any case, uh, something, a mistake that we are doing coming from the uh, uh, WCRP side is to think that climate data is climate information. And it's not true. Climate data is just a piece of the climate information puzzle. So something very nice about uh, climate services is one initiative that is taking place uh, uh, within uh, the working group on seasonal to interannual prediction, and in particular, as part of the decadal climate uh, uh, prediction panel, which is the uh, multimodal decadal uh, forecast exchange. If you go to this website at the Met Office, you'll find plenty of information. And uh, it, will, uh, it will be kept uh, uh, under development uh, by Doug, Doug's group uh, in the next few years. We also have, uh, especially from our community, uh, downstream services. So portals that uh, distribute data and make very nice plots, and uh, they provide some information. Uh, and uh, uh, well, they, are, they, they have a link, for instance, to the uh, uh, ESGF data. For instance, now we have decadal data on uh, decadal predictions on ESGF. And uh, it's, uh, it's a key aspect for success. It's good to have this thing to, to engage with uh, climate services, with the users. But there is a but. And the, the problem comes, uh, can be illustrated with this plot from Andrea Taylor, uh, who is at the, uh, at the University of Leeds. So this is a very interesting, uh, very interesting plot. Andrea is a psychologist, uh, so, uh, and, and she writes very nice papers uh, that I, I, I really recommend you to, to have a look at. Uh, she works on seasonal prediction, uh, and uh, uh, she, uh, and as part of uh, Euporia's, conducted uh, a, a set of interviews, a few hundred, and uh, uh, they, uh, among those interviews, she analyzed the uh, users of seasonal forecasts that responded to a set of questions. And uh, these are the forecasts that indicated in which way uh, they, uh, they received information about uncertainty. So here uh, we have uh, uncertainty in the, in the form of range of values, so at an interval, which is something that we do very often, uh, in, uh, sorry, range of values or confidence intervals uh, or verbal descriptions of likelihood, very tough to, to communicate. Uh, raw data, well, that's something that uh, they already say that uh, they received. Uh, but what they didn't receive is information about 
how good those forecasts are or indicators of the signal strength and what it means or information about possible sources of error. <clears throat> and in portals like this, we can't do this because that goes down to human interaction. And uh, uh, unfortunately, human interaction takes time and, uh, and, and uh, an engagement from people. <clears throat> on, uh, on top of this, uh, we are providing information. At, uh, this information needs to have a quality measure. And uh, one of the uh, uh, groups inside uh, uh, WMO that is, is really doing a lot of work in, uh, in this direction is the uh, joint working group uh, on focus verification research. And they, they address questions like, how do we interpret something like this contingency table that we have here? So uh, these are, this is a table where we put uh, the, uh, uh, the, well, let's say we have a number of uh, events that uh, we've been looking into, and uh, we have also forecasts for those events. And uh, usually, we, uh, we look at this, this column here. We look at the, the events that were observed, I don't know, the hiatus, for instance, or the uh, uh, you know, a shift in the IPO. And uh, we, uh, we look at whether the, the model uh, was successful or missed it in the forecast. And uh, we also look a lot at this one. So there are plenty of pre presentations at the EGU or the AGU saying, well, I, I focused this thing. Yeah? I, it was so good that I got the shift at the right time. It's, it's really good. But what we never see is that box. That's a box in which you have all those cases that the model reproduced or uh, predicted an event that actually didn't happen. And this is the one that is hurting us. What is hurting us is not this one, but this one, because it's the one that is affecting the users. The users are affected by cases in which we cry wolf and the wolf doesn't come. This is the, that's, that's a case. And uh, well, let me just uh, wrap up and uh, conclude with an example of, uh, for instance, a user of, of uh, decadal predictions. And uh, this is the uh, a case uh, that we built in collaboration with uh, a reinsurance company. And uh, there are other examples along the same line in which we, uh, we demonstrated to the, uh, the company that uh, the, uh, the advantage of the decadal predictions uh, with respect to the historical simulations for the next 10 years uh, for their trade, for in particular for the, uh, uh, for the prediction of the impact of uh, tropical cyclones in the, uh, in the North Atlantic, is that the decadal predictions are not just more skillful because we can predict the AMV, but they are also more credible because we have a better estimate of the actual uncertainty of these forecasts, okay? Because we have reduced in a certain way, in a meaningful way, the uh, uncertainty associated to the initial conditions. And uh, I'll uh, jump that one and uh, go to just the last, uh, last overhead, in which I would like to make a plea for all of you to uh, get engaged in, uh, into activities like this one. Uh, this is a fact sheet series that uh, we started as part of the SPECS project, in which we, uh, we try to explain with very simple words and using a vocabulary that has been said uh, previously what we are doing, the kind of problems that we are dealing with. And I know that Ed is doing plenty of things along these lines, both inside the community and outside the community as part of his Gliver activities. Uh, there, is, there is a pressing need for things like this because otherwise we might be out of business sooner than you expect, unfortunately. And uh, this is uh, something that, well, uh, we might, see, uh, we might see uh, before we retire. Um, just a summary. Um, there is a complex ecosystem of international activities, and uh, there are, many of them are relevant to the cable prediction and predictability, but we need to know who they are to uh, take advantage of what they are doing. And uh, at, at this stage, there is, a, there is a, a lot of information missing about this. There is a broadening range of users who is asking for information. And uh, giving them information uh, about the decadal predictions, even if the decadal predictions don't have skill, uh, is, is a fair thing to do because it will be a matter of providing them with a good climatological forecast, which is, again, not uh, as trivial as we might think. 
Um, the Cato prediction is uh, showing signs of uh, providing useful information. We've seen examples here. Emerging all this information into some, a reliable source of uh, 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 information is, is, is uh, not a trivial task either. The users don't want to have five different FUCA systems and uh, then uh, find a way of uh, what, to, what to do with it. Uh, they, it. It doesn't work this way, unfortunately. Um, the, uh, the models have drift, and uh, there is uh, a massive uh, uh, initial shock in uh, full field initialization. The initial shock doesn't go away uh, even when you go into anomaly initialization, and it's something that we have to understand a bit better. And uh, basically, we need to keep asking for investment in observational networks. Uh, we've seen already how important the, the, the lack of observations is. Increased collaboration and uh, a reduction of all aspects that are at the origin of model error. And uh, I think I'll leave it there. Thank you.